I try not to include a million zillion slides, and I know it's kind of a big room, but really, truly, if anybody has questions of anything along the way, just um, happy to address it while you're thinking about it, and we can move on, and that would be great. So um, either way, we should have some time at the end. So it's just some key points of things that I want to kind of drive home today are that my mentor, Eileen Thacker, used to say this all the time, mycoplasma was not a virus. It's sort of in this complex, the PRDC, and it's the, the one bacteria we spend a lot of diagnostic effort on. But it really, you almost have to forget everything you know about PERS and PCB2 and influenza diagnostics to really, to really be able to fully utilize what mycoplasma hyaluronia uh, diagnostics are really telling you. Um, so, and lots of pigs are colonized, but that doesn't necessarily equal severe disease. And that's sort of the hard thing, is that it's hard to time point of infection to where I see clinical signs, because that can be very variable. Pigs are um, colonized early. We don't see disease till late. And there's a lot of factors that um, play into whether we see it early, whether we see it at all. And um, it gets hard to try to troubleshoot on a system by system basis what's going on and that along with that so mycoplasma diagnostics tend to be lagging indicators and which means there's a lot of false negatives in inherent to mycoplasma diagnostics and that's so I'm in the diagnostic lab it's not inherently the diagnostic fault it's so, it's sort of the fault of the bug and and how accessible or inaccessible mycoplasma makes itself to diagnostics and so I think that's the, the key point is we have some pretty good tools for mycoplasma, but they don't tell us everything we wish they told us. And so understanding and having that, that framework to, to see that maybe I should um, not trust all these negatives because that might not be truly reflective of what's going on in the system. And so this is just the comparison of um, a pictorial genome of influenza versus Hyo pneumoniae. So mycoplasmas are, I, sort of, I call them a sort of bacteria. They are the smallest self-replicating organisms that are known to man. And so, but they're also sort of obligate parasites. They've um, devolved over time to make sure that they only have the minimum things that they need and they get a lot of what they need from their host. So they don't have biosynthetic pathways. They don't make um, a lot of precursors for um, building blocks in organisms that other ones do, which means that pretty much no mycoplasma in, a, in an animal or a plant or an insect is harmless. It's, it's always taking. And I think that, and really you can find a mycoplasma anywhere, 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 anywhere. Insects, plants, everywhere that they've looked, there's a mycoplasma alligatoris because somebody looked at an alligator. And so they're just everywhere. There's at least five or six or seven that have been shown in pigs. So, um, and none of them are doing nothing. And some of them are more primary pathogens, like hyonomonia is. But there's all of this balance. And I don't think that the bug necessarily wants to go to severe disease. It would rather stay low level and under the radar screen, which I think is, happens a lot of the time. And then it's maybe sort of a tipping point. And I think that's true a lot of the pathogenic mycoplasmas. And so um, even though it's really small, it's still pretty big compared to viruses. And so if there's maybe 14,000 base pairs in influenza, there's 900,000 base pairs in mycoplasma. And so when we I sort of bring this to sequencing, you know, if we're going to sequence the one or two outside proteins gene, uh, expressing genes in influenza, and we don't really know what to do with that all the time. When we're looking at trying to, how are we going to type, how are we going to, um, what are we going to sequence to look at for mycoplasma, it gets to be a lot more challenging because you're looking at such a small window of the whole thing. And we very poorly understand what the virulence factors for mycoplasma hyaluronia are. We, know what some of the proteins that are associated with attachment, but that doesn't make any toxins and, and, or that we know about. And so it's hard for us to really target what we look at to have any predictive value and to know what, what's, that, what's that mean. So 
There's some tools that we use for epidemiology, but um, we sort of have a long ways to go on that. So it's an extracellular pathogen. It lives kind of, for the most part, I think that's what people, you know, that might not be totally accurate, but for the most part, we, we expect that hyonomonia is an extracellular pathogen, and it lives in the lower respiratory tract on the ciliated epithelia. And so that makes it a little bit in, the, in kind of the mucus. It makes it hard for the immune system to get at that, and uh, makes it hard for antibodies to get at that if it's in this kind of extracellular matrix mucus of the airway. And so that makes it hard to, after you're infected, to, to have a large impact on clearing that organism. And like we talked about, it's an obligate parasite. So it's always trying to induce, and so there's, there's a cilio, ciliostasis and a loss of cilia. And there's some cellular damage associated with mycoplasma, and I don't think we totally understand the mechanism for that. But it needs to cause some host damage so that it can get some food for it, so that it can grow and, and divide, because it's kind of worthless on its own. And so it's pri we consider that it's primarily transmitted south of piglet. So, so some, some proportion of piglets will be infected before weaning and then mixed at nursery and then it just, it's pretty effectively um, transmitted, nose to nose contact, but that there's a rate and the rate that that occurs at will be largely environmental um, and stocking density and and just all of the, the cofactors, the other infections that are going along, all matter to how quickly that happens. And we're pretty much in the very early uh, um, years of understanding differences in strain virulence and difference, just overall differences in strain. And I, I do believe it does exist, but we don't, haven't done much more than show that they're different. And don't have a very good way to be predictive of why, when it matters and when it might not matter and how close is close enough and how different is means I'm going to have a new outbreak. Um, but I do think that, that for a long time all mycoplasmas were just considered the same and then in the last maybe 10 years or so we've been starting to show differences but we don't necessarily have the whole story there. For sure we don't have the whole story there. Um, and so there's been a few studies that have been shown to kind of follow the epidemiology. And if we know that it's being infected early on and then we start doing targeted diagnostics, how soon do we get a prevalence that starts to be meaningful? And it's late. It's, you know, 12 weeks, and I think that that's maybe on the early side. Sometimes it's more like 20, where you start getting a prevalence that maybe you start believing and not just calling false positive. And I think that... The false positive problem is a much smaller problem than the false negative problem, and that it's it's sort of like the if you see one cockroach, that's not just one, that's many, and so sort of the thinking of that those canaries in the coal mine that you see that are and are that might be false positives, and, I, and that's certainly a valid consideration, but it also might be the the few indicators that are out there to be found of a much larger colonization. And because the, the diagnostics we use tend to focus on upper respiratory, um, nasal swabs, even oral fluids. Um, and if it's a bug that's down here, there's not as much up here unless it's being coughed up. And serology is sort of slow to come along as well after infection. Um, when we challenge pigs in um, experimental studies, and we're dumping massive, massive amounts of bugs into lungs. It takes four, and we, and we generally necropsy 28 days post-challenge. So at four weeks after a massive infection, when there's a lot of lesions, we try to, we try to necropsy at peak lesions. Um, the, the DACO probably would start detecting after two weeks, but the IDEX is high negative, suspect, maybe some low positives. And so it's it's going to show up two weeks later. I bet we could get you know almost all of them to be positive in the in a very high infection challenge model. But just to show that it's it's not you can't look at a serology and say two weeks prior it was infected like the way you can for influenza and PERS. And so factors to consider would be things like 
the environment, co-infections. Um, the effect of seasonality, I have a slide on that. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more coming up. And then just to think about how those things fall into guild acclimation and how guild acclimation is different throughout the year um, are some points to talk about here coming up. So this is diagnostic lab summary data uh, put together by my grad student, Carlos um, Nito. And so this is the rate of cases with MHIO per year over the last seven year period or so. And 2006, I think that that probably is a um, tag along with PCB2 caseload. Um, and it was up last year, and I don't know that we've sorted out all the factors of why it was up last year. And I don't know if that we just had a lot, we had a very high caseload last year, um, just overall at the diagnostic lab. And so it's, it, diagnostic da data is inherently skewed, it's not random sampling from the field. And so some of it might just be tag along with um, influenza and PERS cases that they also had mycoplasma. Um, but so, I guess just to throw that out there for food for thought. And then the proportion of pneumonia cases, so out of the total cases, what proportion of them had mycoplasma hyonemoniae kind of follows the same trend, but it sort of depicts it differently. And then associated by age, um, I think t in today's system, it's not a surprise that mycoplasma is, for, for the most part, a finishing disease. And, but we don't, the, the trends aren't, exactly the same for every year. And, and last year there was a significant um, increase in grower. And I don't want to say that significant in the, in the statistical statistician purist saying significant, usually you have to have a p-value on that. So you probably need to watch that. And, um, but uh, just an, I think it's nice to kind of have some of that in front of us sometimes to, to reinforce what we think we know about it. And then this is the effect of seasonality that I was um, talking about. So this is an average of the 2003 through 2010 data um, caseload by month. And that for about six months of the year, it's low. And then starting in late August through early fall, um, the, the numbers are considerably higher. And some of that, um, uh, I mean, inherently we know that there's more pneumonia in the winter, but I think that when you put this in front of you, maybe, it's, maybe you start to think about that the piglets that are born in the summer maybe having less exposure than the piglets in the winter, and then how does that factor into their immune status, and if the gilts um, that come from the summer that maybe have lower exposure are going to be having piglets that are being born when it's high exposure, and just kind of Maybe we're, maybe we're perpetuating something that um, we're just not seeing. And so I like to think about that, that maybe the finisher pigs are great when they're born in the summer, but maybe the gilts that are born in the summer need to be finding a way to get better exposed because we're not getting them ready. And that you can't maybe have the same program every month of the year and that you need to change on a six month basis if this is, if this is what you're seeing in your system. And so, um, from the diagnostic standpoint, when you send in lungs like this, I can tell you have mycoplasma and that's not hard. But when you start trying to apply the diagnostics to other questions like what's the prevalence of mycoplasma in this system and you want to know what that number is, that's where we get into trouble and that's where we have a lot of problems. And so that's where I get, and that's where I get a lot of the questions about what can I do for diagnostics? How can I show that this herd is negative, that these pigs are ready to be introduced. Um, and so for what we, what we have is culture, and culture is pretty terrible for mycoplasma, uh, hyonemonia anyway. It's, it's, it's probably among the most fastidious to grow. Um, and part of that's probably just because we haven't figured out what it likes to eat. The media that we make, we make from scratch. Um, and it has negative swine serum, which as you might imagine is, is a little bit hard to come by, totally negative swine serum. And um, every batch is variable and some isolates want to grow and some don't. And every other bacteria in the world loves to eat this media more than Hyonemonia does. So we have a lot of problem with, with over, over, over contamination. And, but when we do get a pure isolate, which isn't very often, sometimes we're able to do MIC testing. And MIC testing for hyaluronemoniae is very 
the, the data for that is, is very small because, because it's very hard to get pure colony isolates. And so we don't have a great understanding of antibiotic sensitivity for um, hyonomonia, but we are able to do the test when we have an isolate. Immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence are used, and those are nice for the, the pathologist because then they can see the organism at the site of lesions, but it, the sensitivity of it's not, not great. So in the, the lungs with pneumonia, um, it's helpful, but um, as a tool, it's not used that widely. ELISA gets used a lot. Um, it's cheap and it's easily accessible, um, but I think that we just, it's, it's my job to um, educate that when you get positives and negatives, what does that mean? And then I think that there's problems with kits and kit lots sometimes that false positives are real and we don't have, we don't have really good um, ways to do a definitive um, confirmatory testing one way or the other. So we don't have Western blots or some of the other tools that some other ELISAs have that if it's a screening assay that you then go to this more sensitive, this more definitive test, we don't really have that. So we're kind of stuck with the ELISAs that we have currently. Although my lab um, with Chris Minion, who's a professor at Iowa State, we are working on trying to improve that assay um, but I wouldn't say that it's coming, you know, next week. And some of the problems with the ELISAs are that, so the DACO ELISA is to, and it's oxoid DACO, uh, used to be DACO, and I don't even know if it's DACO or DACO, I never learned. Um, but it's to one protein, and it's an internally expressed protein, so it's not necessarily correlated to protection. Um, it's just a protein that seems to be, have antibodies to it early on in infection. So it's to one protein, and so you might think that that might be prone to false negatives. So antibodies might not always be made to that protein in every infected pig. Um, and sort of the opposite is true for the IDEX ELISA, which is a membrane preparation. Um, so detergent is called tween 20 is a detergent, and it just is used to extract proteins in this, this big gamish, and that's what's put on the plate. And so you might think that that's prone to false positive. So there might be some cross reactions and some related species giving antibodies um, that cross react. And I think that that's real, but we have never been able to replicate that experimentally. Um, and when the ELISA was first described, there was a little bit of a hint that flocculari could do that, but we've never been able to experimentally show that again. So I think it's real, and I don't discount it, but um, I think if other mycoplasmas were a huge problem in cross-reacting in the IDEX ELISA, we would never be able to use it because way more pigs have hyorhinus and hyosinovae and flocculari than hyonomoniae. And so, I don't know, it's, it's hard to sort out. And none of those antibodies ever correlate to level of protection. So can I use this as for vaccine compliance? Can I look at these titers and, and predict which pigs are going to be the best protected? They don't do that. And I think part of that is because we don't make ELISAs to the very most important proteins because we don't know what those are. If we knew that if you made great antibodies to this protein, you were going to be protected, then A, we would probably have a better, you know, more defined vaccines, and we would have an ELISA that would correlate to protection because bugs have a way of throwing out antigens for, to the immune system that make look really good to the immune system and don't mean anything to the bug. So that's been shown in lots and lots of different um, systems, uh, virus and bacteria, kind of decoy. Hey, make a lot of antibodies to this while I hide this thing that's really important. And so along those lines, just measuring crude total antibodies isn't going to always um, correlate to protection. When I think that that's true. But, um, so PCR has become the gold standard. Yep. Dr. Strait, if I have a flow phase and I want to know whether or not my plasma is in that group of animals and when, what is your recommendation? Which of these tests should I request or should I request both? And I think one point in time diagnostics for mycoplasma hyonomonia is just going to be always unsatisfying. Um, and so sometimes I wonder. I frankly wonder what the question being asked with some of the diagnostics is because one point in time diagnostics is not a very good way to assess that because 
the diagnostics tend to be lagging indicators. And so looking at it over time and following individual animals or groups of animals over time is going to be more necessary. And then you sort of have to just extrapolate that to the next group because you're not going to be able to look at pigs at eight weeks of age and understand very well who's infected and who's not. And that's sort of just the reality of where we are with it. Um, and so if you're trying to confirm negative, that becomes a confidence over time. Um, testing and testing and testing and feeling confident that, and not just relying on ELISA, also including some PCR on lungs, because that's the, gonna be the, the site where they are, um, is what you're gonna, it's, so it's not a satisfying answer, but it's kind of, it's kind of what is the reality. And so strain typing, we sort of talked a little bit about that. So there's been a f several, I sort of kind of called the alphabet soup of tests that have been developed, and we are able to show differences at protein level, at genetic level, at virulence level, and so there's lots of ways to do strain typing, and the holy grail is to find a strain typing that, that is predictive and correlative to virulence. I mean, that's that's sort of the goal, and right now it's it's at, it's at the epidemiology level. And so it can be useful if it's a new introduction and you want to understand that epidemiology. Sort of the caveat to that is every strain typing system will break out groups of uh, isolates differently. And so what one typing system might call four different groups, another one might call five different groups. And so what's a strain and um, I, tend to, I tend to be a little anal about calling things strains by um, these typing systems because you can kind of be fooled in, in what's the most discriminatory assay is this, what, what this one calls the same, this one calls different. And so what's different, but is it different enough? Does it matter? We don't, I can't answer those questions. But it can be useful in some cases for some epidemiology, which... Um, we're not so much away from that with PERS and influenza and um, we're, we're sequencing for them, you know, there's only a few things on the outside of those viruses and we sequence and we're not so much away from just being able to use those tools for epidemiology. So anyway, so um, I guess I forgot that I did this. The, um, this is sort of the breakdown of the, of the um, IDEX or the tween 20 ELISA. So, crude antigen, um, and then if the pigs have antibodies in their um, system, they're gonna bind, and then we have a secondary antibody, and you get a color change. And so the opposite sort of, it's the, the oxoid is a very different assay, and so the, the indirect uh, idexalyze is, is somewhat quantitative, and you can kind of look at the numbers, and a low value and a high value is sort of quantitative to that pig. In the, the oxoid ELISA, it's a monoclonal antibody is what's bound to the plate and with a purified single um, recombinant protein. And then antibodies bind to that if it's in the pig. And then another antibody is in there and it competes with it. And so if there's no antibodies from the pig, it binds to the protein. And if there are antibodies in the pig, it, com it competes with it. And so um, if there's lots of antibodies in the pig, then none of the antibodies from this kit will bind. And so it's the opposite. The color change occurs in the negative pig. It's opposite. And so it's a little bit semi-quantitative. Um, it's quantitative up to a point because at the point of saturating the ELISA, you lose quantitation. So this is a hypothetical serology from um, a herd, a typical herd, I guess. And so this would be the optical density of the ELISA and weeks in production. And so this would represent maternal antibodies waning, but then pigs are being infected, at least some of them are being infected right here, and then continuously being infected over time. And that this is the line of the positive cutoff of the ELISA. It's not uncommon that you're not gonna see positive pigs until two or three months out. And if you're doing serology here and you're only getting one or two positives out of groups of 30 that you're submitting, you're kind of stuck, well, is that false positive? Is that real? Is that the, you know, the one, the one that you're going to find? 
in the prevalence of trying to find a, I think we think about the statistical, when we send in 30 samples and we're sending in the confidence interval of 30 samples to find one for a prevalence of 10% or I forget what the, what it is, but when you find, then you find one out of the 30, do we believe it? And so um, I tend to, when the, that question occurs, you know, well, bleed them again in two weeks, bleed them again in three or four weeks and see if it's, if it's rising tighter. If it's rising tighter, then it's real. But they can be complicated by vaccine titers, maternal antibody titers, so um, it's, not, it's not easy, I would say. This is a study I did as part of my thesis. And so we challenged pigs with five different isolates of mycoplasma hyaluronemoniae and then followed them out through 28 days. And at 28 days, this is the serology for the, the tween 20 is the precursor of the IDEX ELISA. It was developed and then IDEX sort of adapted it. Um, so they're basically equivalent tests. My lab produces the tween 20 and we use it because we make it and it's cheap and I know this, I know this assay. So um, some of you may or may not be familiar with that assay or not, but essentially, these two should be equivalent. They don't use the same strain because IDEX didn't want to license the strain that we use. Um, so they have their own and they use a little bit different substrate. But intuitively, they should be equivalent assays. And so um, single point in time, ELISA. So green is positive, red is negative, blue is suspect. And I think this just shows that not every, the strains were different even in seroconversion time. And so there was more negatives to our, our normal challenge strain than there were to some of the different field isolates that we used. And at 28 days, this one wasn't having a lot of seroconversion, but they all had lesions, I can, I can tell you that. Um, and that on an individual test basis, if you just looked at individual pigs, there was a fair amount of disagreement. So the IDEX um, pretty much picked up everybody except one or the DACO, I'm sorry, picked up everybody but one. But the tween 20 um, didn't necessarily have great agreement with the IDEX, even though we would expect them to. And so um, while the individual results disagreed, 31% of the time disagreed per, um, between these two ELISAs. And so I, this sort of comes back to using ELISA and diagnostics on a herd basis. And so. If I just only had this pig or um, this one, they're not going to agree um, in which do I believe. But if you do all of them and you look at the whole system, you can start seeing all of these pigs were infected and all of them had lesions. But they don't agree on an individual pig basis. And we see that frequently. And so the first time that I get questions about it, I like to see what all of the ELISAs will tell me about a given serum set just to sort of get a baseline of, of where we are. And so the summary for ELISAs are that they're better on a herd-wide basis than for individuals and that we don't have good confirmatory testings um, other than PCR. So I always go get nasal swabs, bring me some lungs. If we can find the bug, then that's definitive. And if we, so positive is positive and negative is maybe for mycoplasma diagnostics. Um, and that there's not a good correlation between OD values and individual pig protection. And we need to identify better antigens. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then the future of oral fluid ELISA is, I know that we can detect antibodies to mycoplasma, hyaluronemoniae, and oral fluids, and um, there's some work being done on that. Um, I don't know, um, it's too early to tell how, me, how useful and how, how great that that's going to be and where we've been. And we have a study this summer, or this, to this year from the pork board to look at this. But I expect that, so in the serum, you're looking at mostly IgG. But in the oral fluids, you're looking at multiple isotypes. So you might have IgA and, and other isotypes that um, have not been very well explored for their potential to cross-react with other mycoplasmas. And so I can do a lot of testing and screening and comparing them to ELISA for oral fluid. But to get that final step of validation, I need to have specific oral fluid that only has flocculary antibodies and specific oral fluid that only has hyarinus and hyalcinovia to really get a good sense of specificity because I think that there's potential to have even more questions about false positives 
and specificity issues with oral fluid just based on what we're measuring. And nobody ever, I mean, I, I have done one study where we challenged pigs with hyorhinus and flocularia and hyosynovia, and we didn't think about oral fluids in 2006. So, um, so we're going back and trying to make, make those reagents this year so that we can start answering that and seeing if that can be a good tool. Um, so the effective sample type on site for PCR. Yep. Aaron, before you leave that, if you were looking at that and knowing the, from the previous results, would you predict that the DACO test would be a better oral fluid test than 2020 or ELISA more specific anyway? So I don't have a lot of ways to modify the DACO test. And so, because it's, yeah. it's a kit and the way that it's made is these specific monoclonals I think it would be hard without help from the, the company to be able to measure more than just IgG, and maybe that's all we care about. Um, it's a really expensive test, and so if they're not giving it to me, I'm only going to be able to spend so much time spending eight bucks a test to validate that, frankly. Um, we've spent more time on the IDEX, the tween 20, and, and for me, I would do the tween 20 as the baseline and then apply that to IDEX just because I can do a lot more samples economically and I can, I can modify what the secondary antibodies are so I can, I can decide if I want to measure IgA or IgG or IgM, although those, those antibodies aren't totally isotype specific, but I have a little bit more freedom in what I measure in total antibody measurement. So um, the study I was talking about earlier, um, well, there's another study I did for my thesis, and we challenged pigs um, and, then carried, and then kept them for about mm, 95 days post-challenge and with different strains of mycoplasma. And so at 28 days post-challenge, we killed a few pigs. At 70 days post-challenge, we killed a few more. And at 95 days post-challenge, we killed a couple more. It's a little bit complicated because if they were alive, I, had, I took nasal swabs throughout, and then as they died, obviously I didn't have as many to take. So the sample size decreases over time in the pool that became some of these samples. But it's nasal swab, bronchial swab, and alveolar lavage fluid. So these two samples are taken at necropsy and represent a small subset of the larger group. And so we took nasal swabs, and the way I take a bronchial swab is um, making an incision just above the, the bifurcation and taking a swab and then alveolar lavage fluid. And so the average CT value, and so real-time PCR is what we were using. And real-time PCR is inherently quantitative, and which means, and it's a little bit counterintuitive when a, a higher CT value, which is a CT is the number of cycles it took to cross a threshold. And so the threshold's sort of an arbitrary line, and if it crosses that line, it's positive. And the number of cycles it takes is its CT. And so if it takes more cycles to cross the line, then it was a weaker positive. So it's a little bit counterintuitive that a higher number is a weaker positive. And so for nasal swabs, for example, across, and so at 28 days post-challenge, lots of lesions. Mm, not very many, pretty much no lesions in the pigs that were necropsied. But in, in those groups of pigs, the CT values were pretty much consistent over the whole time period. Whereas in the lungs, and this is more like peak time of pneumonia, the CT values, so this would be lots of, and, and PCR is log based too, so a number in the teens is kind of gazillions of copies, and a number over here is like 10. And so it's not linear. So this is a lot of organism number, and that did decrease over time, and I think intuitively we see that in the field too, that there's lots of infection, and then you know pigs that we keep, sows, gilts, um, they have less infection over time. When does this become zero out here, I think is a big question that we also have, and I am not sure that that answer is zero. Well, I know that this answer is, well, intuitively I know that the answer is zero in not everybody. So there might be some pigs that totally clear it, but I think that there's always going to be some pigs that have some low level of infection of hyaluronemonia once you're once they're colonized. And so what this tells me is that nasal swabs, quantitative PCR on nasal swabs 
is a waste of your time because it does not very well reflect what's going on in the lungs and that um, it's very, very, very common to have um, CT values, very, very late CT values for nasal swabs. And so when you start talking about pooling on low prevalence, you're going to miss. And so it's a really expensive test. And, and I get nervous doing, you know, people say, well, I want to do nasal swabs and, I want, and how many can I pool and still get positive? Well, I, I don't necessarily have the crystal ball. And so if the prevalence is really high, and everybody's positive, then you can pull as many as you want. You'll get the same answer. But if you have one weak positive and you start pulling that with five, you're probably going to lose it in our test. And so that's sort of the reality of what's in the nasal swab because it doesn't grow there is what got sneezed into it. So that can be not a very big number. And then um, I don't think anybody in here would argue that taking nasal swabs in pigs is not so fun and not the quality control on how good of a swab you got from every pig is pretty difficult. So um, I think there's a lot of layers that make nasal swab a suboptimal, suboptimal, is that ringing, um, diagnostic sample. And then I think that it's also sort of unfair to compare it to bronchial swab and alveolar lophage because when I do challenge studies, I euthanize with fatal plus chemical euthanasia and then I exsanguinate and when we cut open pigs, they have beautiful clean lungs and they're not full of blood and this swab's gonna come out white and, and I'm gonna target the exact lobe that I want it to go into and the same is true for my BAL. It's gonna be straw colored and pretty nice and I don't know that that's necessarily always true in the way that we're euthanizing pigs in the field, that a lot of times that's going to be a lung full of bloods. And so I haven't done the study with field samples to, to know that this isn't even worse in the kind of samples that we would typically get. Because um, I live in the ivory tower um, of the university. So this is a study that was... Um, published last year um, by a French group and sort of building on some past studies that have tried to look at comparisons of sample types. And what they did that was new was to, so they included nasal swab, they took an oral pharyngeal swab, they did alveolar lavage fluid, but they also took a tracheal swab. So this is a human diagnostic. It's a, you know, an endoscopy sheathed, to, um, swab, they're about 15 bucks a piece, um, they come in these sterile packs, so you can already kind of see that sort of maybe not the most uh, practical for the swine industry and if this is a, a sample type that we go to we might have to start figuring something else out, but at any rate she was doing a tracheal swab in live standing awake pigs and this is similar to how I challenge pigs with high, for high on pneumonia. So, you have a gag that keeps the mouth open and you sort of blindly fish a tube into the trachea and when that happens there's a pitch change and you can you know you're in um, and not in the esophagus. There's a skill to it, there's a finesse to it, but it's not if I learned it, anyone can learn it kind of thing. So, so then you take a swab and you're taking a swab then where the bug is. You're getting a swab in the ciliated airway and so then she compared that sample type to, um, so the frequency of pigs in the study that were positive by nasal swab, oropharyngeal brush, tracheal bronchial wash, and a swab. And so basically, the tracheal bronchial swab had the best sensitivity, which I expect it to have the best sensitivity because that's a very good sample type. And that, well, essentially, the, the tracheal wash and the tracheal swab are equivalent, but the tracheal wash is, hard, is really hard to do in a, in a live pig because you have to anesthetize. Most of the fluid goes to the caudal lobe and then you get a very small amount back and you're not getting the cranial lobes that tend to have the most organisms. So that's actually not an awesome sample unless you are doing a post-mortem and then we talked about that the post-mortem samples aren't always pretty either. So this is a, and you don't have to kill this pig to get this sample. So there are some studies being done to kind of look at the feasibility of this. Um, and compared to nasal swabs, nasal, so the order was 
nasal swab kind of stinks, oropharyngeal is a little bit better, and I kind of consider oropharyngeal probably in the realm of oral fluid. Because you're, you're, cough, you're sampling what's in the mouth, you're sampling what's um, being coughed up, and so they're probably somewhat equivalent samples. And then these, the samples that are doing the lower airway, and that's always gonna be a better sample. And every study that's ever been done, that's the best sample. And if you start getting better sensitivity with this, and you can justify pooling, and you have a $25 test, then there should be a place where that you intersect on the economics of doing individual nasal swabs on a kind of crappy sensitivity assay versus pooling on a more expensive sample type. But then, so anyway, I think the, the economics justify, or can be justified if we decide that this is a good way to go. And then obviously the sample is really good for PERS and influenza and other things that we look for in the lungs. So um, back to oral fluids, um, did a summer scholar project um, a couple years ago for this and we collected samples in conjunction with a vaccine field trial. And so the herd was known, the source herd was known to not be totally free of mycoplasma, but they didn't have a lot of colonization going on. And so there were lots and lots of pens of 50 pigs and then we chose six of them um, six of 52, and we challenged two pigs in the pen, intertracheally challenged with our lung inoculum, which is a ground up lung homogenate from um, pigs infected with high pneumonia, and called those our cedar pigs. And then we followed samples out over time. And I sort of tried to make this be more realistic to the number of samples that you would collect in the field versus an oral fluid. So it was six pens of 50 pigs. We took one oral fluid per pen and eight nasal swabs per pen. And I didn't follow individual pigs. I just had them go pick eight pigs. And then they took serum and nasal swabs. And the oral fluid was collected when the two cedar pigs were running the alley. So we weren't including the pigs that I intentionally infected. We were only including pigs that were the contact pigs when we had them collect oral fluids because I didn't want that to skew it. And so we, this is just the summary of PCR. So the percent positive of all the pigs by PCR. And so the, this minus four week one is, is um, because I think that the herd was inherently positive that we got one positive nasal swab here. And then they were challenged here so four weeks after challenge, we got a couple nasal swabs, but no oral fluids. Eight weeks post challenge, so um, we got all the oral fluids were positive and a pretty high percentage of nasal swabs were positive. And these were individually tested nasal swabs. And this, looking back at this, it makes me cringe because I should have been collecting more samples here. When we infect pigs here, it takes about two weeks for them to start coughing, which means it took two weeks for them to start really transmitting it to other contact pigs. And we kind of missed the time point where, which is, which is faster, nasal swabs or oral fluids. I think we sort of missed that. Um, but um, so to add another layer of interpretation, I looked at the CT values from the two sample types. And the CT value from nasal swabs was 36, and this is, this is pushing some cutoffs from some assays. And you would maybe get even called out negative in diagnostic labs with results like this. Excuse me. And the oral fluids were 32. And so saying PCR is log base 2, which nobody thinks of, log base 2. And so when you convert that into a log base 10, every 3.3 CTs is a tenfold change. So this is essentially 10 times more sensitive than nasal swabs. And that's like... So it's two, four, eight, halfway to 10 is 3.3. So, um, so in a weak positive sample type, that can make a big difference. And so that sort of changed my opinion. And then that's sort of that's, uh, um, maybe intuitively oral fluids better because uh, you're, you're sampling what's coughed up instead of what's in the nose, and so maybe that's going to be just a higher concentration anyway. 
And then you're able to just obviously sample a much larger population with oral fluids than you are grabbing eight pigs and doing nasal swabs and pooling them. So maybe the one guy that is really coughing and has a decent amount of organism in his mouth is going to chew on that rope. So I think there's sort of an odds game as well. So the key points were that so MHIO doesn't behave like a virus. It's the diagnostics are significantly different and, and frankly, much less satisfying. Um, colonization doesn't equal severe disease, and the MHIO diagnostics you do today are telling you what happened a few weeks to months prior. So these are just some of the questions that get asked. Um, this is my last slide, and um, I don't, I'm not even sure how much time, where we are on time. So, I mean, if these are, after this talk, if there's still things up here that you wouldn't know exactly what you would want to do, I'd be happy to go through that or whatever. I mean, what's, whatever would be more useful. I sort of feel like if I do this, this might be kind of droning on, but. Um, Chris, on the slide you showed with the Daco and, and versus anybody in the IDEX, there were people challenged pigs, right? Five grams. And about 32 samples with one negative on Daco. Yep. Right, so I would have expected, based on how the test works, that you could see more false positives potentially with Daco. So that. That seemed like an odd slide. So, the DACO we would, intuitively to me, I expect the DACO to induce false negatives. And I didn't show that today, but the study where we kept pigs through 90 days, I was also challenging pigs with flocculary. Frankly, I was trying to, we'd use two strains of flocculary, and I was trying to induce as high a titers as I could because I think the high titer flocculary is where we start seeing potential issues with especially the IDEX ELISA and I could not do it. I could not get high titer flocculary and they didn't cross react and they also included pigs that had high rhinus and high synovia. and so we didn't see any, I couldn't induce any cross reaction with any of the pigs that we challenged and so the, the DACO I expect to be have, be, have better specificity when it is positive because it's to one protein and we consistently see that we can get positives at two weeks post in our challenge model. And so I expect to have a lot of positives early on in the DACO and fewer with the IDEX, just because every protein that's, there's more proteins in the IDEX, but they're in a really small amounts. And so um, it's sort of a numbers game that you have to have a certain amount of antibodies to a lot of different proteins to be able to be positive in that ELISA. Um, and so knowing how the ELISAs are made, that, that makes sense to me. Um, sort of the economics of the assays adds a layer of, well, we're not going to do DACO as our screening test because it's, it's a really expensive test. And um, so um, that's the data for that. But when we were doing the, the larger challenge with the, so we had four strains that we challenged pigs with for high pneumonia, and then we did antibody titers throughout. And we had one, and they were just randomly chosen from our collection. And there were, the IDEX and the Tween 20 were pretty comparable, but not, and, and we saw the same, that about a third of the pigs on an individual pig basis didn't agree between those two ELISAs. And there's not a trend of, well, the IDEX is always more sensitive, and they're always more positive than the Tween 20. It was just like, it was random. That one would be negative, one would be positive, one would be suspect, and we saw every combination. And so those two, um, that I would expect to be very equivalent, disagreeing about a third of the time, and then the DACO was more sensitive. And then once they all seroconvert, then the ELISAs are pretty much equivalent. And, but we did find one isolate that, for whatever reason, pigs, pigs got infected and they had lesions, but the antibody titers in that group were significantly lower than they were to the other three. So I think that another layer is, there are strains of high pneumonia out there that don't induce good antibodies in pigs that are perfectly well infected. And, and we did Western blots to even show that just quantitatively there were few antibodies, fewer antibodies made in those pigs that were not the least affected. So they didn't have, they were in the middle of lesions of the groups that we challenged. So 
perfectly good challenge, kind of a weak, and, and they were positive by the IDEX, but they were weakly positive, and some pigs didn't seroconvert very well at all. So um, I didn't include it because, um, well, but someday I'll get it published. But um, it's sort of confusing because I don't know how you take that into the field because you, you don't know what your strain does. I was mentioning earlier you talked about the environment of co-infections, especially that cough and late finisher. What are some of the other co-infections we should be looking for? So PERS is the big PERS is obviously the big one that's been shown that PERS and mycoplasma make each other worse. They make them show up earlier. They make them stay longer, and that interaction has been shown pretty consistently. So the herd that looked negative for mycoplasma over the years, and for all intents and purposes for you was negative, when you introduce PERS, you might start seeing that mycoplasma, and we've seen that in cases before. Um, influenza seems to be more of an additive um, effect. Um, PCV2, um, there's been a fair amount of studies of just like parasites. Um, I, it's, I think that pretty much anything that makes the pig sick, so this tipping balance. Mycoplasma kind of I think wants to be in equilibrium with its host if it has the choice, but if you start throwing things at it, and in the swine industry, all the big things that we care about have some impact on the immune system. And so the pathology for high on ammonia isn't, we don't think, necessarily that there's a toxin or something. It's, it's the host, the host response to that bug is the pathology. And if you can find a way to get the host to ignore high on ammonia, you actually have less lesions and you're essentially better off. And they've done like one small study 20, 30 years ago where they thymectomized pigs. And so they got rid of the thymus, they got rid of the T cell component. And those pigs got sort of just as sick or um, just as colonized, but they got less sick, less lesions. And so we have that, then we have PERS, and PERS affects the immune system. We have PCB2, and PCB2 affects the immune system in a different way. And that's a lot to put onto a pig who's going to try to um, interact with all the other bugs that are coming at it and, and have a fully functioning immune system. And so I think that that probably is, shouldn't be lost. That, um, and, and then and there's papers that will show that um, continuous flow systems have higher lesions, um, you know, increased stocking density, being in a pig dense area, and there's a lot of factors, air quality. So it's, it's the other environmental factors that sort of have a tipping point. That, and that's how, I think that's the, the current thinking. The question about vaccine compliance, um, do you see many producers asking that question today? And if they are asking that question, do you get test results that answer that question? How are they designing the compliance testing? I mean, what test are you Yeah, it's, it's occasionally I'll get a question, and pretty much my answer is no. So we don't generally go too far in that. I mean, unless you're going to use it in a herd herd wide basis, and some some of the vaccines aren't don't in, as intensely induce antibodies that are detectable by just from just the vaccine, and so that adds another layer of of question. But because individual antibody titers don't necessarily correlate to protection, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go to court for somebody who was taking their their stockmen their or farm workers to task over not vaccine because of the ELISA titer, um, because it, I don't think it's meant to be that. So um, certain vaccines and certain dose um, regimens are more easily detected with vaccine, and we certainly, in challenge studies, vaccinate pigs and follow that out and see titer changes and then an increase in titer when they're infected. But it's not one-to-one, -one and I wouldn't I wouldn't presume to want to put a program out in the field for that. Interestingly, there was a paper a few years ago where um, a group in Germany, they did what's called a peptide array. So they sort of synthetically made a bunch of little peptides. And then they screened pigs, antibodies that were infected versus um, vaccinated, versus vaccinated infected, I think. And they found a protein that shows up in naturally infected pigs, antibodies to a protein found in naturally infected pigs, but not to vaccinated pigs. And the reason for that probably is that everything that we do for vaccine and ELISA production 
um, for the IDEX. It has to be a cultured organism, and proteins that are expressed in culture aren't exactly the same as what's expressed in pigs. So there's already a bias in that. And culture passes over time, changes protein expression. And you can see that in Western blots. And so if we're making vaccines and they don't include this protein, you're not going to make antibodies to it. But if you're infected with that pig in a natural infection, you'll make antibodies to that protein. So they, they proposed that they had found a differential protein, but that was like five years ago, and I haven't seen anything come out of it. It's a protein we're looking at and including in our panel that we're looking at at Iowa State because I think that that would have some value of being a somewhat discriminatory assay. But the assays we have now, I wouldn't use for that.